great. So we're um, really excited to host our inaugural West Kootenai Climate Hub webinar series that features hub partners and initiatives. And um, as we open, I'd like to acknowledge with sincere gratitude and humility that we are on the traditional and unceded territories of the uh, Sinaiks, Tanaha, and Silks peoples. And in these unsettled times, I sincerely hope our culture can learn from the wisdom of indigenous peoples and knowledge so that we can restore the harms that we've created on the earth. And so that future generations of humans and other life um, may be able to live and thrive here. And I want to just pause for a moment because we have these indigenous acknowledgements that sometimes seem really um, rote. And I just want to make sure that we can just pause and think about what that would really be like. Yeah, thank you for letting us slow down and think about what it would be like to live on this in this place for many generations to come. So before we get going, I want to mention just a little bit about the West Kootenai Climate Hub. So we're a new organization that launched last fall. And uh, that was after having conversations with um, other people in the community for over a year. We're yeah. a, a solutions focused, nonpartisan and volunteer led okay. organization. Yeah, sounds good. Organization. Um, sorry a little uh, disruption there. So um, we're a solutions focused, nonpartisan and volunteer led organization. And our mission is to accelerate climate action in our region by helping dedicated individuals and our 22 partner organizations and growing uh, better communicate and collaborate in order to amplify our work. And so we also share resources and successes and ideas with other climate hubs across the country as part of the Community Climate Hub Initiative. And so by attending this webinar, you're actually already helping, um, helping us succeed in that. So, so thank you everyone. And uh, last thing before we launch into today's topic is um, please mark your calendars for next month, March 18th for our second in this series when we'll be um, featuring an exciting initiative or a dream as the team has been calling them themselves looking at an active transportation route between Nelson and Castlegar. And we'll be featuring the West Kootenai Cycling Coalition and others um, on that event. So, um, so watch our March newsletter and social media for more details. So without further ado, I'm really excited to pass things along to um, Mel Lavery with the Youth Climate Corps. And, uh, Mel is the coordinator for the West Kootenays and she's living in Nelson and she's working on her master's in Ro at Royal Roads in environmental education and communication. So um, thank you, Mel, and I'll pass that on to you. Hello, everyone. It's so nice to see all of you here. Thank you for taking some time during your lunch hour to come and join us. Um, I'm going to start a slide show presentation. Um, please give me a holler if you are unable to see it. Um, yeah. Okay. So we are the Youth Climate Corps here in the West Kootenays. And um, thank you so much, Laura, for welcoming us to this land and giving us some time to reflect. Um, I'd also really like to take a moment um, to acknowledge the funders that have allowed us to operate here in the West Kootenays. Um, Wild Sight would like to thank recent supporters of the YCC programming, uh, including RJR and Francis F. Miller Foundation, BC Parks, Columbia Basin Trust, Eco Canada, Portis BC, Get Youth Working, Kules Nakoff, Kootenai Career Development Society, Kootenai Employment Services, Living Lakes Canada, Preston Werner Ventures, and the province of BC. Um, pretty much uh, what we'd like to do over the next hour is talk about the program, um, talk about 
where we're going with the program and also to bring you in to what you think the value of bringing youth into a climate core in your local community would look like. I'm gonna pass this along to Emily and Ben, who are past members of Youth Climate Corps. Emily and Ben, if you just want to take a moment to uh, talk to the program overview and also some of your experiences as former members. Yeah, sure. Thanks. Um, uh, as most of you can see, that's me over there <laughs> pulling the funny face. Um, I don't know what was probably um, <clears throat> uh, making fun of Kate or something, but the YCC is a, um, a training program which empowers youth um, to take action in, lo in their local community um, to, uh, for the um, climate crisis. And I joined um, because I recently moved to the area. I moved to Winlaw and I wanted to connect with some like-minded people about issues that I thought were important. And the YCC uh, program just popped up on my Instagram. Like I'm super grateful for the algorithm Instagram has because um, it uh, connected me with some really amazing people and gave me such a meaningful experience. Um, I was a part of the crew from this past fall, starting in September, um, going until December. And we started the program um, with the Kootenai Career Development Society. And they were doing their fast forward program, which is uh, um, also a training program that uh, gave us that, um, trained us in work, like, uh, in work experience for job interviews, writing CV letters, uh, writing cover letters. And that was a really, that was for two, three weeks. And that was a super valuable experience, I think, because we got to know each, we got to know each other on such deep and personal levels before we even met each other. That was all uh, over Zoom. Um, so that's how we, we started the program. And then the next, uh, the next thing we did was we went uh, and did a fire mitigation. Uh, we did a fire mitigation um, training or employment with Lucky Tree Service. Uh, that was in uh, Nelson. And we did that for about a month, which is also valuable because we got training, uh, is doing hands-on hands -on experience with chainsaws and um, tree identification and really understanding what it means to work in the forestry industry. Um, well, that was for a month. And after that, we went over to, we had some time to do community engagement program uh, projects where we um, had to come up with an idea that we believed would be important to our community in, um, in addressing climate issues. Uh, I'm still currently doing my project. It's actually, mine's not finished. I decided to make a bat condo. Um, for those of you who don't know, it's a, 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 bat, a bat roost that can, habituate up to 6,000 bats. Uh, I'm making a small one, so it's only 3,000, but um, yeah, we have a huge mosquito issue in, in Winlaw, and I decided that uh, that would be a really um, benef beneficial way to address that issue um, and also increase biodiversity in, in our region. Um, so after that, we worked 
at Bannock and Bloom, um, which is an agroforestry project in the Slocan Valley, um, just south of Silverton in, uh, just south of Silverton uh, at Bannock Point, if for those of you who know that, uh, for that place. And it was a site that was recently logged, um, but we are trying to, we are playing with ideas to regenerate the land using edible and native species. Um, and during that, we learned so much about permaculture, agroforestry, soil science. Uh, we met with some really amazing people in the, um, in the West Kootenays who are involved in that. So, um, that was a, that was an incredible experience for us as well. Uh, the, it just like all of the projects that we did kind of, they're all super diverse and gave us a really um, versatile experience in uh, what we can what we can do to address climate issues and I think every day when I woke up I didn't feel like I was, I was going to work I felt like I was going to um, to learn with my friends in something completely different uh, and completely fresh and new each day um, so yeah I think now after completing the program, I have a new confidence in myself and new support structure to really make a change in my community and even uh, outside of that and further and beyond. Thanks so much, Ben. Um, do you have anything to add to that? Yeah, I think that's a really great summary um, that Ben just gave and um, just this kind of like maybe more of a overview. Um, the program consists of all those things that Ben has just mentioned. Um, and I think that it's important to mention also that the program has, I was a part of the initial program in 2020 um, that took place in Nelson. And in 2021, we were able to start a program in both Nelson and Kimberly Cranbrook. So there's now two locations where the Youth Climate Corps takes place. Um, and the goal is to eventually expand beyond those locations um, and continue working on those similar types of projects as well as looking for other projects that meet the objectives of the Youth Climate Corps and fit the community needs. I guess I should have mentioned at the very beginning, I will be um, bringing on a bunch of really wonderful people to come in and, and speak about the program. Um, Emily and Ben here, YCC cohort alumni. And then um, next, I'd like to bring in Graham, who um, has been part of the YCC vision from the very beginning. And I'd really like, uh, he has a wonderful perspective on the history of YCC that would be really valuable to share for all of you. Thanks, Mel. And I guess I'll say almost the beginning, not, not quite. Um, so the, the, the version of the story I know is that um, two longtime West Kootenai locals that some of you may have, be familiar with, Richard Klein and John Cathro, in the winter of 2020, with the arrival of COVID in North America, and the continuing climate crisis. Um, they were going ski touring together um, in the area and hanging out in a ski hut and thinking about these problems. And in particular, um, seeing the uh, overlap of urgency between acting on climate and um, figuring out how is our world gonna work with the arrival of the pandemic and looking toward the summer and thinking about prospects for youth summer employment um, they, they both have children and or grandchildren. And so through those conversations, their vision of Youth Climate Corps was born and they didn't let it stay an idea. They went out and talked to their community. Um, and there were a number of other local people that pulled together um, a, a very humble but powerful half day retreat in June of 2020. There, and I was lucky enough to be invited. There were about 25 of us 
half local youth and half older community leaders. And we spent half a day um, with our dreamer hats on thinking about what a youth climate core be, could, could be and should be. And, and after that, we started work in earnest, um, trying to find uh, startup funding and pull together the pieces and figure out on, on the fly with hardly any time at all, what are some meaningful things we can do here in this community um, to move forward on climate uh, while creating um, an employment opportunity for local young people at, at a time of um, significant economic challenge. And so we ran our pilot program from September 2020 to January 2021. Um, as Emily mentioned, um, Emily was part of the cohort and, and also Lynn Murray, who's on the call here, was one of the other 14 initial crew members. Uh, we did lots of things. I, I um, will be happy to talk about them at, at a later time if, if there's um, curiosity around what our pilot program accomplished. But in, in the end, we were awarded a sustainability leadership award from the city of Nelson. And overall it was, it was inspiring and, and, um, and productive. And so we've, we've kept on. And as Emily mentioned, we've been able to expand to our second location um, in 2021. And we're continuing to look at expansion and, and trying to do better in the places that we already exist and, and trying to help out in more places as well. So I, I think I'll, uh, wrap up there and pass it on to Mel. Thank you, Graham. Yeah, so we, um, we've been growing in a really wonderful way since uh, 2020. And it's been really exciting to see that growth. And we are still really um, trying to figure out and understand where we fit in, both in the West Kootenays, but also where we, where we can go from here. And so I think, in the context of the future, we in the West Kootenays have these really wonderful resources locally, like the West Kootenay Climate Hub and the West Kootenay Eco Society, who um, have done really big work on creating the 100 renewable, 100% renewables campaign. Um, and so that that allows for a, a bit of accountability within our community infrastructure to be putting in place specific. Um, benchmarks to, to make these goals. And we look at things like the Nelson Next Plan that notes um, very specific things within the area that need to, be, um, need to be worked on if we are going to approach a changing climate in a way that is going to be resilient. And um, I think that here at the Youth Climate Corps, we think that municipalities will become the front lines of climate action. And we do believe that the Youth Climate Corps can be a pivotal resource in those moments where human labor is going to be essential in creating, um, in meeting these benchmarks that have been identified, both uh, through the Nelson Next Plan, 100% renewables campaign, and also through uh, the budgets that we've seen come out um, and action plans by our municipalities highlighting things like enhance the sustainability of city services and infrastructure, um, strengthening our neighborhoods, and also expanding jobs and prosperity throughout the, the region. Um, some things that the Youth Climate Corps has, uh, is hoping to achieve in the future is um, creating like assistance in short-term hiring within these municipalities, trying to create a way that um, working on things like fire, uh, like fire mitigation work around, around the townships or even working on like fire smarting um, activities within townships. And uh, thinking about also how the curriculum that we are creating for these participants, how that could be transferred back to uh, participants' hometowns with uh, this oncoming cohort that we are hiring for currently for the end of March and the beginning of May, it's been pretty amazing to see that in um, the three, uh, two, like two, two years of us operating, we have started to get applicants from PEI, Nova Scotia, Vancouver, New Brunswick, and Ontario. So our, our pool of um, people that we are getting interest from is becoming wider and wider. And so not only are we thinking 
um, municipality wise and like in a small context, but we're also thinking about how are these things going to be expanded across Canada? How can we make um, connecting with community and um, thinking in a, a small way, act large? How do we transfer those things? Um, the national rail of the YCC, which um, pretty much means uh, the, the section of the Youth Climate Corps that is trying to brainstorm and trying to make connections to um, not only like provincial and federal, uh, provincial levels, but also federal levels. They are uh, constantly evolving, constantly creating new connections. And um, we see a lot of promise um, for, for how the, that side of Youth Climate Corps uh, will hopefully be implemented, not only within the Kootenays, but uh, provincially and, and soon, soon federally is, is our goal. So um, lots of really big ideas and lots of, um, lots of hopefully uh, opportunity for the future for some wider implementation of the Youth Climate Corps. Uh, we would really like to um, take a moment during this seminar to actually bring you folks into some brainstorming. Um, in a moment, we are going to break off into breakout rooms with you folks. And we are gonna go over, uh, if you haven't interacted with a Jamboard before, uh, this is a really neat little tool for documenting ideas and to like have a place to um, earmark some good conversations. And um, how we essentially use the Jamboard is, I, there are three questions that we want to ask you folks and to talk about in our breakout rooms, our smaller groups. And when you think of an idea, you can press this little button on the sideboard bar here to pop up a sticky note. You can choose different colors, um, any color that you'd like, and then you can um, type anything that you'd like. You can save that. And pressing onto that main board, you can take that sticky note and you can move it around. Um, and you can also make it bigger or smaller. Uh, I'm not seeing on. your screen, Mel, just oh, to let you know. We still have oh the no. PowerPoint up. <laughs> okay, let me yes. just, oh, it says it's paused. One moment. Hmm. You can always unstop share and start again. If it's easy. I'm going to start again. Thank you for letting me know. <laughs> sure. Okay, is that working a little bit better now? Yes. Great. Okay, so hello, welcome to Jamboard. Um, yeah, so this on the side bar here is your menu. You have the sticky note menu. You can choose colors here. Um, and then when you click save, you can click the main page again. Um, you move that sticky note around and again, expanding it, rotating it. And then once you feel like you have exhausted all of your ideas within that first question, you can move up to the main, um, the top menu bar and you can go into the next frame and the next frame. Um, so when we are in our breakout rooms, we will have a few members of the YCC in each breakout room and they can assist, um, assist with any technical difficulties and help facilitate this conversation. Um, I'm gonna pop the, uh, the link into our chat. So there's one separate board for, we're gonna be in three breakout rooms. And each, chat room will have its own separate Jamboard. This one is for group one. This one is for group two. And this one is the third group. Okay. And you'll let us know what group we're in. Yes. Um, I think, 
Michael or Kaylin, did you folks already put people into breakout rooms? Separate them already? I have uh, made the breakout rooms and they are created and ready to go. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Great. Okay. Um, we are going to spend about 10, 10 to maybe 15 minutes in these breakout rooms, and then we're going to come back to this main room, kind of talk about um, some main points that we have covered, and then uh, we'll leave some space for question, a question and answer period as well at the end. Okay. Hi, folks. Uh, we're going to stay in this main section, and that way uh, we'll have a little bit of a recording of what this process is like in the main um, in the main room. Otherwise, it wouldn't be able to be recorded. But if you folks want to um, go into the first link at the very top. Is anybody not able to get into that Jamboard link? Is it in the chats? That's where we're looking for the Jamboard link? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Which one would you like us to go into? Into the first Jamboard one, if that works for you folks. It's making me install it. It's making you install it. Mm -hmm. Is it working for everybody else just fine? Hmm. Are you in maybe the Google, the Google Chrome browser works really well with it. I don't know if you're in a different browser. I should, no, I'm not. No. Yeah, you guys just go ahead and I'll figure this out. So you guys, you guys just talk. <laughs> Where is the, don't even wait. Um, what I could also do is share the screen, and that way, even if you're not able to. Um, maybe contribute, maybe you can talk about things in that way we can add your your input onto the Jamboard. Does that work? Sure. Okay. Yeah. And then for you, fo uh, you folks who are actively using the Jamboard, you can just exit my screen and you'll still be seeing the same thing. Mel, yeah. I went back to where you told me to go to, but now I have a sticky note that's just, oh, somebody else must be typing on that one then. There's a sticky note that's right in front of, the, in front of my screen, oh. but it's not mine. Oh. 
if I do that. Yep. Maybe if you uh, press the escape button, because I just put up a, that was me right here. Okay. Okay, I'm gonna do one now. Uh, Ooh, I would love to talk more a little bit about the capacity to hold complexity. I would love to hear from anybody who would like to talk about that. anybody going to talk about that? I think that's a great idea. I didn't post that, but I'd like to mention something about it from my perspective. Is that okay? Yeah, yeah, go for it. <laughs> um, the capacity to hold complexity. So I didn't post that, but, um, you know, I think how do we hold ethical spaces within the community so that we can have complex conversations? You know, when we're talking about climate action, you know, we can't step away from the fact that we're talking about land and we're talking about unceded land and unceded territories. You know, where can we have those safe space conversations that kind of need to happen? I think that's a really great point, Leslie. Like, how do we? How do we talk about hard things and how do we be safe about talking about hard things without there being a right or wrong answer? From a really anti-oppressive perspective, you know, um, I think that that's a term that I don't hear enough sometimes in community. We're talking a lot about, um, you know, almost like it come, becomes like a fight between people over <laughs> some things. And I, I think, um, a uh, part of climate action is understanding that we are all fundamentally human beings and that we all fundamentally need clean water and clean air um, and access to green spaces. <laughs> so <laughs> that's kind of where I'm at. <laughs> I can just comment on that. That kind of fits in with the one that I put up about being well-versed in the sociology and the psychology of talking to people who maybe are skeptical or dismissive or doubtful about climate change. And I think finding common values, um, I'm just reading Catherine Hayhoe saving us right now. Mm -hmm. And there's no point in just throwing a bunch of scary facts at people because it usually makes them turn and run. But if you have an understanding on how to connect with people, and I don't know who mentioned the values, but um, you know that person is, is, according to Catherine Hayhoe is absolutely right. You need to find what your shared values are and start your discussion there because we all want the same thing ultimately. Um, mm -hmm. We want to be safe. We want a future for our children. We just don't necessarily agree on how what that change is going to be and how much change there is necessary, et cetera. Mm -hmm. I love that, Judith. I think something that I really appreciate about uh, Catherine Hayhoe's writing and dogma is just like the idea of finding commonality between um, between people. Um, so that brings me to another thing. I don't have a sticky note, but um, what about collaboration with regional nations? I know that the ONA and uh, like the CCT and the Tanaha are kind of working together on some salmon restoration projects. Um, you know, I assume salmon would be considered important in this conversation as well. What? And how do we build those lasting relationships between uh, like our regional indigenous um, youth and uh, the regional indigenous indigenous youth as well. Um, so they have those lifelong friendships and are sustainable. If I were to paraphrase that, uh, like building relationships between, like long last, building long lasting relationships. Between regional and indigenous youth, is that what you said? Yeah, so like our, our Indigenous allies and regional Indigenous youth, and especially their, um, 
one of their climate action interests as well. Maybe that's another sticky note. Mm -hmm. Edward, I noticed that you have your um, your mic off. I was wondering if you wanted to share anything. Sorry, was that to me? Oh, to Edward. Oh, Edward, OK. <clears throat> I might, um, if you folks are ready to move to the next slide, I think this is like a really great collection. Um, I'm also happy to have a, any other comments that we want to talk about on this before we head over. Sense of humor, I would add. Oh, I love that, Nicole. I think that's brilliant. Sorry, I came in late, so I, I'm trying not to be messy, but that I would add that in if that helps. Thanks. I think it does. I think that's great. Okay, let's head over to the next slide, uh, which you can find on like the main uh, main menu bar at the very top. And it's just the arrow to the right. Oh, it looks like people have already been adding. That's really wonderful. Uh, using your imagination, what could be the best possible project the YCC can do? Um, and I guess just to give some people some context for what has already been done with the YCC, we, uh, we've worked on quite a big selection of things. Right now we are um, going to be doing some work at Bannock Point on an agroforestry project, which Ben had talked about. We will be doing a retrofit construction and training program uh, where we'll be doing a lot of in-class things and then we'll end up um, applying those skills onto uh, community uh, community infrastructure. And uh, then we also have worked with um, Slocan River Streamkeepers on um, riparian zone restoration. That's something that we'd like to continue doing. And also with a lot of um, permaculture uh, farms in the area, just going around and and helping out there and we've also done just yeah some smaller little pieces here and there in terms of um, working with like living lakes and water uh, water monitoring projects and wildfire uh, risk reduction projects as well that's been quite a big thing in our past that's not going to be necessarily in our programming this coming season but it's open for for future future programming Oh, I like that, like a, a different style of nest lab. Nest, um, I think that's really, really interesting. I'm just gonna, do we have any um, food sustainability projects like um, seed banking? or um, yeah, something like that. Almost like a food sovereignty project where we could just, yeah. Yeah, that's a great, great idea. Um, with the Bannock project, it does um, focus a lot on like food, food forests. Uh, it's a food forest that we're trying to, to implement. So um, planting things that are going to be able to be edible um, in the area, which is really exciting, but I think um, diversifying that in terms of like food, uh, like food harvest, and I think that idea of like making seed banks is a really interesting, interesting addition. Um, I'm also not sure of what. Again, I think <clears throat> collaboration with local regional youth and the indigenous nations as well, like 
again. <laughs> it's a good um, <laughs> piece to bring in. I think that they really complement each other again, having those common at, common goals, I think <laughs> it's important. Yeah, if, if I could just, I'm, I'm switching between Zoom and doing the document and I'm not sure how helpful my sticky notes would be, but if I could maybe just riff off of Leslie's comment. Um, I'm a Nelson City Councilor. <clears throat> and if we're talking about decolonizing, even reconciliation, you know, as the, <laughs> that's the goal, we're still in the, in the truth telling um, piece uh, in, in that organization or trying to even uh, get there, right? So we're like we're way, way before the beginning almost in terms of, of the work that we're doing and how, you know, every, every youth don't offer a threat per se. And so I think the advantage that youth have is a voice that um, brings hope and uh, perhaps a lack of fear of change. And I think that, that that modeling that you do is so important. So I would love to see that, um, you know, relationship building piece uh, with uh, nation to nation relations, as well as um, intergenerational, both, you know, I think those both could use some support. <laughs> and I don't mean to put this responsibility on youth by no means. But it is, there's something in what you offer to the world um, with your age and perspective that can, can guide this change, the, the so many changes that we're looking for right now. I don't know how to put that in a sticky note, but there you go. It's <laughs> a hard one. Um, yeah. <laughs> focus into a small section. Maybe just relating, relationship building as a, you know, as a focus. And that's with all people. I really like that. Thank you, Nicole. So I think that um, everyone should be back in from their rooms. And I just wanted to open the floor maybe to some synopsis or some big questions or thoughts that came up. And yeah, if you wanna, maybe if we can raise a hand down at the reaction level at the very bottom of our screens at the menu, if you wanna share anything. I see Judith has a question. Go ahead, Judith. Just a question. Uh, what is your relationship with the school system? Do you go into the schools at all? Um, what's, what's, yeah, what's your connection with the school? Elementary, high school, middle school? That's a relationship that we are trying to understand because of the timing of our programming. Um, it, uh, it doesn't really lend very well for high school applicants, um, but it is something that we would really like to encourage is like working with high school and working with elementary on projects. So uh, some things that we are kind of looking into right now are um, like restoration projects and how to get student, like young students involved in that, especially things like invasive species, um, uh, eradication and, and replanting of more native. native species is something that we're looking into at the moment. Leslie, did you want to go next? Um, yeah, I, you know, it was really interesting. I really, really enjoyed our discussion. Thank you, group, for, for sharing. Um, a couple of things did come up that um, were a great opportunity to listen, so I appreciate that. But the one thing that came out was the fact that you know, we've been talking about as a country universal basic income and wow, what an amazing opportunity that would be for this kind of work. Because if you weren't always focused on how you're gonna pay the rent, how you're gonna, um, you know, buy groceries and how that was all gonna work, it would be much 
less challenging uh, to step forward and be available to do this work without that concern around um, chasing grants and sponsors and, and everything else, which I, I know doing work in that field is takes up a lot of time. And, and it's the uncertainty for anyone involved in it and it would allow maybe longer projects. So just made a connection for me. So thanks. Thanks, Leslie. Laura, I see your hand is up. Yeah, well, I have a couple of logistical questions then. So how many youth um, are you going to be able to uh, have participating this year in both the West and the uh, East Kootenai? And uh, do you have to turn people away? Or did you have to last year? For the West Kootenai this year, we are, um, we are looking for 12 participants um, and that is kind of a construction or like a, we, we need 12 participants in order to fulfill certain project outlines. So it's just kind of the parameter that we are looking at. Um, as for past seasons, we have had to turn some people away La uh, our, um, last season in, the, in Nelson. We, we were able to accept everyone, which was really exciting. Um, I think Tim here, Tim is here. He's from the East Kootenai. He's uh, running the Kim Cran section and he'd be able to talk a little bit more about how many participants are able to be accepted into the program this, this spring. Yeah, hello, that's, uh, that's me. Um, 10 would be a nice number. Um, we'll see what what happens when we open up our applications and we go through hiring and eligibility and different criteria that we have to meet. Um, last year, I actually didn't, wasn't responsible for the hiring of the crew. We had six people. It's a nice number, you know, they're, yeah, it's kind of a juggle from, from year to year based on what kind of criteria you have to slot people into, but we think that 10 is a good number and is something that's manageable as well, because as soon as you start inflating these numbers and as much as we'd love to take on 10, 12, 15 loads of folks, um, the coordination effort kind of starts to become unreasonable for just Mel and myself. And so unless the Youth Climate Corps develops a cloning <clears throat> device, um, <laughs> we have some limitations in that sense. And there's also can, a limitation of like finding enough projects for participants to um, participate in. And I think it's just like at this stage we're at where we're just building, we're building partnerships and building an awareness base. And so trying to find uh, potential partnerships for the amount of participants is, is, a, is um, an obstacle too. If we bring on too many participants, it's hard to place people in meaningful work. If I can add a, briefly, a big picture thought is that, um, so Tim and Mel are speaking to our, the constraints we have in this two-year-old program that we've built. Um, but if you, if you put on your dreamer hat and imagine the tremendous amount of work that needs to be done across Canada and the world um, to act on climate, like uh, part of what we're doing here is trying to do good work right now in these places. But part of what we're trying to do is, um, is tell a story and capture people's imagination with a concept. And, and so um, imagine Youth Climate Corps teams working in every town and city across Canada, um, thousands of people uh, cumulatively um, serving their communities, launching their own careers and futures um, and getting things done rapidly. And, and, and so we, you know, if you, uh, links were put in the chat, there's a link to the Wildsite Youth Climate Corps program that's working here in the Columbia Basin. And then there's the link to um, our uh, national, Youth Climate Corps national arm, which is um, where we're, we're trying to um, move this concept forward, um, talking to provincial, federal, and other governments and other players to um, try to capture people's imagination at that bigger scale. Thank you for raising that, Graham. That came up in our breakout room as well when we were talking about, um, you know, what would be some of the best projects that um, that YCC could do. And a lot of what came up was about inspiring other people, but inspiring other youth and 
just kind of mobilizing others. So yeah, that's very much in alignment with what you're saying. So thank you for that. Are there any other questions that folks have for the, the team here? Don't be shy. Leslie, go ahead. Sorry, I'm an old fashioned, um, I, I can do put the That's hand okay, up. That's okay, yeah. Is, um, you know, when you were talking there about across the country, I know that Katimovic has been rebooted, right? Do you have any links to possible funding or affiliation with that organization? Um, I can speak a little bit to that. My partner is actually, um, he he's doing a study on Katimovic currently oh. um, for his master's and he's also involved with the Leeds Climate Corps National Rail. Um, so uh, they're, they're a different structure than the Youth Climate Corps for sure. They have like a little bit of a different focus in terms of like cultural experience. Um, yeah, I'm familiar with it, my daughter did oh, it. Oh, awesome. It's, it's a fantastic program. It is so wonderful. And they definitely have a very different funding structure than we do. Well, it's from the government. Um, yeah, exactly. There's like a lot of security, but um, yeah, I, I think that we can learn a lot from them in terms of uh, what kind of systems they create to make people um, excited about their programming and to have it be a sustainable and long lasting program and to understand how they've bounced back from um, being an obsolete program at one point, like being, being destructured. Mm -hmm. So I think that is something that we are looking to learn from them and to understand how, maybe if there is a potential for collaboration, but that's not really like necessarily a, an avenue for us at the moment. Mostly I know there like was a, one in Nelson at one point in time, but I think it's quite a while ago. I don't know if anyone here would remember there was a Katinovic house here. And one other big aspect of the Katinovic program is that uh, participants get a stipend, like a living stipend. They don't get paid a living wage, which right. they don't have any expenses, but um, it's we're, we're looking to, to allow people to have a living wage while, while learning yeah. and, and having work experience. Yeah. We have another Leslie. Go ahead, Leslie. Hi there. Um, one thing, um, especially when we're talking about that global movement of climate action and climate justice, um, you know, I'm of course always curious as to what the collaboration with local regional indigenous nations is. You know, we're talking about, I know that the Caldwell CCT and the ONA and also the Tanaha are all working together on salmon restoration and other pieces. And when we're talking about this kind of stuff, we can't, you know, deny the unceded nature of the territory that we're personally in. Um, and then also um, that, that there is a global indigenous initiative movement for global climate action and stuff like that. So I'm just curious as to what, if there's anything that has happened um so far or if that's on the radar or if um yeah just curious i i think maybe graham might be a good person to talk about this but yeah it is definitely on the on the radar and there have been like definitely consultations made um graham do you want to speak a little bit more more to that yeah, I'm, again, I'm conscious of time here because I, I think we're supposed to end at, at the hour. Um, but yeah, for, for sure, in, in Indigenous nations need to be um, core players in all climate action. And um, it's definitely something we're thinking about, about um, building relationships and creating meaningful opportunities um, for design and engagement projects, but also benefits from projects. And um, be more than happy to talk with anyone um, that, that has ideas about how to do that, how to do that best. Um, West Kootenai Climate Hub folks, I, I guess I'm, I'm not sure at what time we need to wrap or if we can keep going. You can, um, you know, I'd like to go to the uh, top of the hour if, if possible. And if people have to drop off, that's great. But um, yeah, we have a few more minutes if, uh, if you want to say anything more about that or uh, another question. Yeah, I mean, I, th I think, you know, just to 
just to talk br briefly more like it, it's um you know it's a it's a significant piece of work to build projects that engage indigenous partners in in meaningful ways and um something we're working to or toward over the long term um for, for us just getting started a a, a more um a, an easier to a more accessible um way to weave in indigenous perspectives into the program just to start with has been um, engaging indigenous knowledge keepers um, to help educate our crews and, and be part of their learning. And that's something that's been a positive element in both locations um, that we're running so far. And, um, you know, working toward that, that longer goal of, of not just um, giving crew members exposure, but um, also but actually running projects that have meaningful indigenous partnerships behind them is um, on our radar. Nice. Um, I'm happy to have more conversation if you're interested, Graham. Thank you. Let's yeah. do that. Okay, thanks. That would be really lovely. Thank you. Think... Oh. Go ahead. Go Ron. ahead, Ron. Yeah. Uh, I just <clears throat> listened to a presentation by Greg Utzik and talking about salmon restoration and with uh, warming of the lower Columbia River that uh, in the future salmon may not make it past there, won't be making it up into the Kootenays, and whether that's a viable long-term project. Yeah, I think, sorry, I just have heard similar conversations as well. Um, and I think, you know, when we're talking about uh, habitat restoration, um, looking at the dams and stuff like that, you know, climate justice as well, what those look like. Um, in in salmon restoration, I think is important to our whole ecosystem up here. Um, I just wanted to be conscious of our time here, and um, I am really grateful for all of these really wonderful questions. And I think that um, they open up a lot of great conversation and things that like we would really love to continue talking about. I want to provide my email here. Um, if you do have ideas as to how to embolden um, relationships within our communities and Indigenous partners, that would be really wonderful to please reach out. I think that that is a conversation that we want to continue to have. And um, we're always looking for really interesting projects in the community to to work on as well. So please, if you if you do have connections or do you have ideas, we really like to hear them. Um, and I also really want to plug that we are hiring for our next cohort in the spring, and we have two intakes. So our um, our first intake is at the end of March, so March twenty eighth. Applications are due on the fourth of March. Yes, March is our next month. And then our next intake is also at May 2nd and applications for that second intake will be due on April uh, April 4th. So April 8th, April 8th. Um, Graham has just posted our application information here and also be aware that our Kimberly Cranbrook crew is also open, opening their their hiring process too. So please take a look at that if you know anyone in the East Cooties that are looking for um, from, for some really exciting work over the, the spring and summer. And our age gap is 17 to 30. Yeah, so please do reach out. We really love to hear from folks. And uh, thank you so much for taking the time to spend your lunch hour with us. It's really appreciated to see all your faces here. Well, thank you so much, uh, Mel and team, for all of the information and the inspiration and a lot of ideas that um, are going to be clicking around in our heads as well. So thanks for your contact info. And um, it would be great if you wanted to share some of the insights after you look through the Jamboards. It'd be really interesting. So um, feel free to share it with me and I can send it out to folks that um, have registered for the call. So so thank you, everyone. Have a wonderful rest of your day. Hope you get a little sunshine um, on your face there. And uh, yeah, keep carrying on, doing all your good work. Thanks, everyone.
Michael, do you want to stop recording?